Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us for the first WGI Percussion Community webinar of the season. My name is Caleb Rothy. I'm the Percussion Education Coordinator for WGI Sport of the Arts. And our special guest this evening is Ian Grom. Ian, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So uh, Ian and I are gonna try to cover a ton of ground tonight and talk about all sorts of uh, what we hope will be interesting topics for everybody. Um, he and I have some questions prepared. There's some things that I wanna pick his brain on, but I truly think that these sessions are best when they are as interactive as possible. So for everybody that's uh, tuning into this live tonight, we've got a couple of tools that you can utilize to participate in this. The first thing I wanna point out is that there is a question and answer feature for all of you. Um, so if you have a question for Ian or a question for me, you can just type it into that Q&A tool. It'll pop up over here on my screen and then uh, we can kind of field those questions as they come through tonight. If you already have a couple of questions in mind, go ahead and pop those in there right now. You don't need to wait for like the end of this. We kind of consider the whole thing to be a Q&A session. So you can type those in at any point. Um, we also have one additional feature that uh, this season that we're gonna try out and, and hope it goes well. If you're attending live, um, there is a raise a hand feature. And if you want us to go to you live and you've got a mic set up and ready to go and you wanna ask one of us a live question, uh, we can do that. We can kind of throw it over to you. So um, if anybody wants to give that a shot, if your question is a little bit better asked uh, out loud rather than trying to type it out, um, you're certainly welcome to do that as well. So we're gonna try to go about an hour tonight. The conversation is rolling and it's fantastic. We'll keep on going with things as long as we've got great questions coming in. Um, and as long as we've got new and interesting ground to cover. So I think that's enough of all the housekeeping stuff. Ian, what do you say? Should we kick this thing off? Let's go, I'm ready. All right. So um, Ian, you and I have been friends for a long time um, and uh, both reside here in Southern California. So we've been doing this thing um, uh, both as, as colleagues and as competitors at some point um, and as, as great friends for a long time. Uh, but I know not everybody attending knows you as well as I do. Would you mind starting just by giving us a bit of a rundown of your bio and your history and the activity so everybody knows where you're coming from. Sure. Um, I graduated from Cal State Long Beach in 2004 and got my Bachelor of Music in Performance. And at that point, I had no desire or interest whatsoever in the world of marching and had thought it, like kind of just dismissed it. At the time, John Mapes was also going to Cal State Long Beach and he was like, Get me the hell out of this school. Just give me that my degree. And I'm like, I'm going to do music forever. Give me all the degrees. Um, and then I decided not to do any more school. And after I uh, finished my bachelor's, I just decided to do the drum set thing in L.A. for a while and kind of simultaneously started teaching for some extra income. I started teaching at um, my very first gig was at um, Santa Margarita High School and then Edison High School, and then all these little tiny schools back in the mid 2000s. And the next thing I know, I was like, John, I have no idea what the heck I'm doing. Um, can you teach me something about this, uh, this pit thing? How do you guys do that? Because I was a, a college mallet player, meaning no one actually taught me technique and you had to sort of figure it out. So to come up with some sort of system, John was like, well, basically, here's this exercise. The mallets start up, they come down and they come back up. So that was about all the knowledge <laughs> that I got with a, a little bit more um, elaboration from him at that point. Um, but then I just started teaching with him everywhere around 2005 just to get my feet wet in the activity. And then the next thing you know, I was kind of at a crux of, well, do I still try to pers pursue my professional career as a player um, or do I keep writing music for this weird thing that I've started to fall in love with? And then about 2008, I'd made the full transition from no longer playing professionally and had gone full time into the composition thing, writing marching band music for winds and percussion and writing all original music with John. And then we started box six and basically everything took off from there. And then after that, I did the cadets for four years where I kind of wrote some electronics from 2009 to 2012 in the beginning, then started co-writing some of the percussion stuff and helping them structure things all the way through like the Angels and Demons show. Got to do a lot, big picture with all of that. And then went to the Blue Stars for four years and was heavily involved in the music design, co-writing the brass stuff with Richard Saucedo on a lot of that. And then gracefully bowed out of DCI before it became the insane arms race that it is today. And now I am teaching at Chino Hills two to three days a week and pulse on the weekends as well as designing for power percussion. Awesome. 
So you mentioned um, Chino Hills, Pulse, and POW. I know those are the three groups that you're working with right now and they're most active. Can you give everybody a little bit of insight on your specific responsibilities with those three groups? What roles do you play with those sure. groups? Uh, for POW specifically, I'm in the design chair and um, usually com composition, arranging, design, all of that, but I don't do a lot of hands-on teaching there. Part of the way that we were able to make POW sustainable over time this is actually POW's 10th anniversary this year, which is crazy to think about. Yeah, fielding two independent world ensembles and now like two ensembles in the, um, in the top eight. It's just totally crazy. Um, but the only way we were able to sustain that was to have two completely separate staffs between POW and Pulse because the sharing of goods doesn't really work out too well when you're splitting people between the two ensembles. So I maintain my role as like sort of intellectual property creator and making all the magic happen and kind of help them staff the people that know how to create our type of productions and then look in on them, of course, and want to make sure everything's jamming over there. Um, but all the day to day stuff I do at Chino Hills. I'm at pretty much every rehearsal and um, uh, make sure that all of that is kind of in line. John's the program coordinator, but I kind of coordinate the music on top of with whatever he's working on with the battery and share a similar role at Pulse. Um, but I have now tried to find a place at Pulse where I'm not there quite as often. It used to be I had to really grind it out in the sectionals and doing all that. But I've really assembled an incredible team of people that can teach there. So I don't have to always be in, but I am in usually at least once a week, if not twice a week over at Pulse. That's great. Um, so one of the things I wanted to talk to you about tonight is just music and orchestration and composition and programming and all that stuff. Because I'm a huge fan and have been for a long time of what you do and kind of your voice in the activity. And I was hoping to pick your brain on this a little bit tonight. Um, so one of the things that I'd like to do is really like to discuss with you um, one of the characteristics that really stands, stands out to me about many of your shows is the soundtrack. I mean, there's, there's a lot of great things about all those. But when I see a show that I know you've worked with, um, the soundtrack is just something that gets stuck in my head and really stands out to me as, as kind of like an overriding characteristic. So I'd love it if you would share a little bit with all of us what your typical process is for forming the soundtrack with each of the ensembles and shows that you put together. Absolutely. Well, thanks, man. That, that really means a lot. And that is really like, I think, a pivotal um, part of our entire process is the transportability of the music outside of that and when i refer to transportability i'm kind of referring to a concept that was turned on to me by um this guy that i like following on youtube and he talked about transportability of music meaning that can you walk away and sing it in the same way like once someone teaches you happy birthday can then you go teach it to someone else can you sing it and recreate the essence of happy birthday um, a lot of percussion music can be very impressive but it's not necessarily transportable you can't take it and sing it for someone and then you know they get it what the show's about and so i think now that i have a word for it, it, it it's i like the word transportability but i think the memorability of any music is something that you can take with you and not just go man it was really vibey and cool you're like no i love that haunting melody that was dun 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 something like that is transportable and it you can sing it on different instruments, you can do whatever you do to it, but it's still kind of in essence what's there. So I think to create a powerful soundtrack, you have to start simply. And I think a lot of it starts um, probably 50-50 with John coming up with source material where he'll go, okay, we've been thinking about this visual idea and they usually won't tell me about it because I'll go, well, what if this happens? How's that guy gonna fly in the air? Well, what happens? Where does the pit go on the floor? So I, I have too many picky things. So he waits until a lot of that stuff's fleshed out so I get a more complete idea. And he'll play like an entire, like maybe three minute research track that might even have some cuts. And he'll be like, I don't know what this weird thing is in the middle, but it's dope. Maybe we'll use it, maybe we won't. And it kind of gives me like a an audio storyboard of where his head's at with the aesthetic. And then sometimes I will use that directly and it's very much like a spotting session in film scoring where the director sits down with the composer and says, I want music here, it should feel like this. Here we inserted some John Williams music in the fight scene, make it sound like that, but not too much like that. And once we know what that is, I kind of very specifically know what my job is before I go to the piano. 
And that's always my second step. Without fail is going to the piano. Um, I will hunt for sounds later. Um, there's an amazing quote that I heard, and I feel like um, so many people, my, my, their first question is, what sound libraries do you use? Man, I need those sweet, sweet sound libraries. I was like, well, sound libraries don't write music for you. And it is much better to have good music and eventually find the sounds than have good sounds with crap music. And so many people put the cart before the horse on that. So I, I think I've always been a purist in that my first step lives here. Um, as you can see, I've just got, I've got keyboards everywhere. Can barely play them, but I, I keep them around to make me feel better about myself. Um, it so, looks legit. At the very yeah, least, it I mean, looks legit. I mean, let's be honest. That's what this gig is, right? It's 50% right? looking legit. The other 50% mm -hmm, may or may not be legit. But you're 50% there. Um, so I think for me, if we take something like we define the mood, and, and if there was something I wish I would have been more accurate earlier, was knowing that you don't have to use all of the notes in all of the shows. And limiting your choices conceptually of like, you're a chef, right? And you've got to create a, a fixed menu for your audience. And in that menu, you might think you need all these ingredients when in essence, to give them a seven minute menu, you can only use a certain amount of ingredients before you've gone too far, you stretch yourself too thin. And as people eat through the menu, they're like, what am I doing? Why is this in here? And so I think in my early days, I would write it all at the piano and I was like, I'm so clever. Listen to all my cleverness. In essence, like, look at all the ingredients, my bountiful ingredients I brought to you, you should be thankful. But in reality, the meal didn't make any sense because right in the middle of it, you served dessert, but then there was two desserts at the end, but then also you started with a savory sweet thing. And although each one in its insular little snow globe was a delicious dish, you used too much of it throughout. So I think now, stripping the sounds away and living at the piano helps keep you honest of like, how am I gonna develop an idea? How am I gonna create this aesthetic over time? And then a lot of it comes down to really, once you do that, you gotta be really on top of it and not be writing against a deadline. I'm never writing against a deadline ever, in the sense that I'm not like, oh my God, rehearsals tomorrow, this music has to get done. I like finish the music, we send it to John, we go back and forth, marinate for a week or two, a lot of times at Pulse, we finish, like now, we finish writing the entire show in one sitting in one month. I write for four weeks straight almost, and we finish the entire show. We don't write any other music. We just write that. And before anyone gets any music pass out, then we sit and go, did we do the right thing? Let's check it out. And that marination process, um, a lot of the honesty that is developed here that this is believable and transportable, translates once you add in all the other stuff because you've orchestrated something that has strong roots and strong foundation. When you're writing against a deadline, you're like, man, this sounds sick, uh, boom, send. And then you learn it, oh, it's just the kids, it's, it's them, they just gotta play it better. Then you're like, March, like, man, once they get it, it's gonna be great, April comes, damn, I suck. And then you just press the reset button, right? Because you never thought it was you because you're writing under the gun and you're just like, boom, 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 boom. But I don't like to run that way anymore. And the more time we have to marinate, I think the better the soundtrack is because it's not panicked. It's always patient. It's a full painting before it gets distributed out for the most yeah. part. Well, and I think that's something that, you know, a lot of us in the activity struggle with. I know I did, especially early on in my career. Um, I'm writing against a, a gun like the, I have rehearsal tonight. The kids need something to learn tonight. I've got to get something ready to go and in their hands for this. Um, and that was never my best work. So when you're able to plan enough out ahead of time and get an early enough jump on things, it gives you that time to be able to marinate. It gives you that reflection time as a composer or as an arranger to really you know, have that critical ear before you're passing anything out to students and hearing it live. Um, 100%. I, I would say the default is when I go to make my printer parts, because my first process is make the MP3. This is like the audio soundtrack of what we want the audience to hear. And we put a ton of time into making our soundtrack on the MP3 good. I don't believe in like, you know, we're just bringing it to life in person, but I'm already doing the production that I'm going to do in person in the MP3, in Sibelius, in VDL. I'm getting the mixers right. Like, mm. Marimbas will never be really that loud in real life. So I have actually done half the season's worth of rehearsal mentally before I come into the first rehearsal. 
And by the time I go to orchestrate the parts, I almost have to remind myself of what the opener sounds like because I've usually moved on and so far into the rest of the charts. And that's kind of like when I go back, I almost get it with fresh ears again when I orchestrate. And then it's like kind of a double over of fresh ears and insight. I want to pick your brain on one thing, and I think you already kind of covered this, but it was a question that somebody sent in, and they were asking about uh, the design team that you work with, which is primarily John, but you guys also have other people, visual designers and uh, programmers and stuff like that on, on the team as, as well. Um, they were wanting to know what your process is, and I was just hoping you could kind of underscore this a little bit. They were basically saying, hey, do you guys map out the whole show musically first and then fill in visual? Do you map out the whole thing visually first? and then fill in music that matches it. Um, what's your priority? And I think you mentioned something in there about you almost think of it as a film composer where the idea kind of gets selected and kind of starts to get refined. 100% of the time. Yeah. And yeah. so then your, your idea is I need to craft a soundtrack that matches what this, you don't want to say theme, but what this concept or what this universe is that we're trying to create my job is to create the soundtrack. Can you just underscore that a little bit for us? Sure, absolutely. Um, our big kind of powerhouse cell that is essentially create everything is John Mapes, Rochelle Mapes, and Steven Estadio. And that is kind of the, the trifecta visually of like conceptually coming up with stuff. And Rochelle is a super brilliant choreographer and comes from the professional dance world. So she brings a movement aesthetic that's not just informed by indoor percussion, which can be somewhat limiting. And her experience in modern dance and all that brings a lot of cool stuff. And she was the one that brought the green table to the party last year for the Pulse Show and kind of made us aware of that. And Steven does so much work in both indoor percussion and specifically marching band and drum corps, bringing his resources into the fold. It kind of allows them to have a visual enclave where they can stew and brainstorm and do all that without really my interaction. And essentially they come with like one big idea that some ideas have a lot of tentacles coming out and they're really well developed. And sometimes it's just a blob that we know is a really sweet blob, the best blob, but it doesn't know where it's supposed to live yet. Doesn't know what it's gonna turn into. And that's where I come in conceptually and go like, well, who's telling this story? Like, what's the audience supposed to feel? Sometimes we get in a, a, a conceptual philosophical discussion because that lets me know like, what is the music supposed to make the audience feel? Should the audience know exactly how to feel from beat one? Is there a delayed resolution of that? So if I know 100% that the audience needs to feel impending event, then I can create tension. And then again. And then there's resolution, you know? So like that would be something that like I could just, and I would already hear that in my head. I already knew what those notes would be if I wanted to create tension, resolution. But the immediate impression in the beginning is sort of the psychological journey. So. I think for me, once I know the event plan timed outline, essentially, meaning that, okay, we're going to do this cool intro, all these people are going to do this stuff, but it's going to take a little bit to move the props, and then we're going to go, boom, flash dance, whatever, whatever, whatever the event is. Pick up a prop, throw things, yeah, everyone's going to clap. How long is that going to last? Like, mm, minute-ish. Cool. What's next? What's the middle? And then why does everyone care about watching the show at the end? And essentially, once we have those hallmarks of the show relatively sketched out, then we start talking about what does this feel like? And most of the time, John has already created sort of a soundtrack, uh, a color palette, if you will, kind of like referring back to the, um, the, the recipe of, of all the ingredients coming together. John will kind of lay out like, I think the meal should be this and the audience should feel this way, but I'm open to other ideas. And that's where the craftsmanship starts happening with the back and forth. And, at that point, I'll start creating what we call like our mood sketches, where I might just have piano and strings and just basically lay out like a minute and a half of music and go, I don't know if this is right. Is this like, am I painting in the right like general color scheme? And everyone's like, yeah, that's dope. And then the next version of that will be 
super detailed with all the stuff in that needs to be in and then send it to John so he can create the battery stuff. But most of the time it's big visual idea first. Is this gonna be awesome? Yes, it's awesome, great. Then soundtrack becomes crafted, then battery parts get created and the interaction begins. I love it. I, I love that it's a tiered approach for you. Um, one of the things that you said that really resonated was this idea of sketching out a general concept, sharing that back with the rest of the design team and go, do we all like the direction this is headed um, before you've done all the detailing and put all the stuff in, before you've gone down that path and you're kind of married to it and it's almost AKA because the the rabbit hole. you're so attached to it. Yeah. Uh, just that what a what a great approach and what great advice that I think really anybody can take and run with. Um, one of the things that I want to ask you about is the difference between scholastic and independent. I know you write at a really high level, right, and design at a high level uh, for ensembles in both of those realms. I'm wondering if uh, you see any differences between designing a scholastic show versus an independent show, or or maybe there aren't any differences. Uh, and I'm wondering if there are any conscious things that you do differently. Um, for those types of shows and if you have any advice to designers um, in terms of the difference between programming for an independent and a scholastic ensemble. You know, I, I was thinking about this because I think it's also interrelated to the concept of basic, intermediate, advanced, just at all skill levels, kind of regardless of independent or scholastic. And because we have so many groups around the country, specifically kind of in Southern California in the scholastic realm that are pushing the envelope of comparably competitive with independent groups in some ways, I think then we have to go like, okay, well, let's take Scholastic Independent out of it for a second. And let's just talk about like, what are my students capable of? Mm -hmm. And then what am I asking them to do? So I think the threshold for me has now become, what can you do, but be extremely musical? Not what can you do to showcase your knives? You know what I mean? Look at all these sharp knives. They're the best knives. You're like, can you cut with them? I can only cut very fast, very fast. And then you're like, well, that's, that's great. But like, I need to make these little things and I need variety. And you're like, but look at my knives. They're the fastest knives. And I feel like that's everybody arguing for their content, right? And that's why like WJ has tried to get rid of the word content. And I think Marrying the idea of skill set relative to musical achievement or musical maturity is where there does, there's a discrepancy in mm -hmm. that it's expected at the independent world class that you are playing the craziest stuff with the maximum amount of expression. And it's kind of like, if you're not doing that, it's already a tick, you fail. I think at the scholastic world level, and I think this translates all the way down, which is why I'm just talking about the top. And then I think at Scholastic World, you can get away a little bit more with playing some really amazing things and maybe it doesn't have super masterful musicianships, but, but you go, wow, that's high school. That's incredible. So there's, I think there's that caveat of, wow, that's high school. It's really impressive. Is that stuff as impressive if the exact same show got duplicated in Independent World? Probably, but I just think there is a inherent expectation in the audience that like, you are gonna do the craziest thing ever. You have to set new standards. And in high school, at the highest level at Scholastic World, I think groups are doing that, but I think there's a little bit more leeway almost. And I don't think um, the depth of what's being offered, like independent world right now is crazy, top to bottom. It's so deep, there's so many incredible groups, and I don't think Scholastic World is quite at that level yet where every single group top to bottom is like really nailing it and bringing so much energy and so much innovation and all that. So it's kind of weird. I don't really know where like the line is between Scholastic and Independent, because there's groups that would easily counteract anything I would say. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. So, um, you mentioned, we have a couple of questions that have come in. So I want to throw one of these your way. And, and what you were talking about a minute ago about um, really knowing your performers and design, you know, whether it's scholastic or independent, whether it's a open or world as well, knowing your performers is the most important thing you can do as a designer and as an educator. You want to custom tailor a show to them and their capabilities and yes. what they're going to be able to bring to life. Um, we got a question from Jake. He said, it's a two-part question. Here's the first part. Do you have any tips or methods to maintain and build upon the skills of more experienced players while still building the skills of the younger players at the same time? 
you have any thoughts on that? How you kind of approach uh, a multi-skilled ensemble where you have players in different places? Oh, yes. Figure it out, kids. Here we go. I mean, that's basically it. Like, in the summer, we bring down the tempo and we, we address everybody at the um, – Here's how you hold the mallet because we want the returning players to revisit their fundamental fulcrum understanding and all that. And all of the information in the beginning is given as if you have never really been in the ensemble. However, the acceleration of information as we move through time does not wait for the younger players in order to foster a culture where the kids need to learn like, wow, I have to like really keep up. And then you go to the older players and go, hey, over there, vibe four, you gotta check them out. They're not really happening. Can you find some time with them? And then it builds interpersonal relationships from the student leadership down without me having to basically be the, hey, did you learn your part? Did you learn that? I put it on the section leaders to handle that. And then it kind of creates a expectation culture where even the young ones coming in know that immediately they're in the hot seat to have to be able to hang with the older players. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, if we're using this activity to teach life skills. And I think we all are because um, that's ultimately we want, what we want our performers to get out of this experience. Um, making the older, more seasoned, more veteran performers responsible for extending that ladder down to the next generation and helping them and kind of shepherd them along in this process, that is so incredibly important, A, for the, the success of your program, uh, and then B, to also give those more veteran members um, some of those uh, those coaching and counseling and peer tutoring type lessons that we can embed into our ensemble. I think uh, Ian's advice is incredibly crucial. While at the same time, I love that you recognize that, you know, in this activity, we don't have a second string. There's no, um, you know, freshman football version of what we do. Everybody is on the floor performing and everybody is a target, you know, of the um, the spectators and the, the people that are watching the show, they're going to watch everybody. Perform. Everyone. And the judges are going to assess everybody that's performing. And so that's everybody's right. got to, you know, hop in the boat and get up to speed on, uh, on doing what they need to do. So and I think with that, you have to be super smart about knowing that every single person is going to be asked to achieve. So give every single person a task that they can achieve and make sure that you as the teacher can teach them to achieve that. If you're just asking the student to achieve something that you don't know how to teach them, then you've already failed out of the gate. And I see that so often. That's like, oh, man, my kids, they just, you know, they're just not consistent. I was like, is it really the kids? Is it really the kids? It's really never the kids. It's almost always the adults. And I think that is the most important lesson we have to have. If at the end of the season, you're still complaining about your kids, you're really complaining about yourself because either the writing was wrecked, the teaching was wrecked, or both. Yep. I, and there's a lot of, I mean, as an educator, you have to wrestle with that, but there comes a time when you realize like, it's me, it's on me. I've got to, I've got to make a shift because uh, yeah. the kids are just, they're doing what I asked them to do. Um, right. And, and even if I feel like they're not doing what I'm asking them to do, maybe my approach is wrong. Maybe my, you know, maybe I'm not making the connection. So I, I think there's a lot of value in that. The other thing I would recommend is we all as educators tend to gravitate towards spending our time in the center of the ensemble and near some of our strongest players. And the most important thing we need to do is to get away from the stronger players and spend time on the periphery, spend time on the student that is struggling on vibe number three. They mm -hmm. need the information way more than our center marimba needs or than the center snare needs or anything like that. So um, make yourself traverse the entire ensemble and give feedback where it's most needed. Yeah, I think when you don't know your ensemble or your teaching skills very well, traveling is a, a number one thing I teach all of my young teachers that come in to work for me. Um, number one is always start, like look all the way down, go to the end mount player and look all the way down the line. You'll see every early attack, every bad release. You can see everything. And then make sure you make a comment to every kid, even if it's a small comment, every rehearsal so that after four weeks, the rat kid doesn't feel like, ah, it doesn't really matter what I do. No one's giving me a comment. Yeah. I, and that, that was always one of my goals. Every kid should hear a special <laughs> piece of information from me in every rehearsal. If I'm doing my job, every kid feels like their presence at that rehearsal is important because I address them individually, not in a macro setting. Yeah, they might um, not like what I say, but I'm going to address them. Yeah. Um, Second part of this, and, and it might have been a little while because I know like Chino Hills, they're high school students, but these are all very highly motivated students that definitely know what that ensemble is about. 
But I know you and I have both been in the trenches many years ago, working with ensembles that were pretty inexperienced, lots of young players, a very inexperienced ensemble. Um, Jake was wondering how you keep up morale over the course of the season, especially when it could be a challenging season in SCPA or WGI or wherever. How do you approach that? That is rough. I just remember um, my early days when I was the only person teaching and um, because now it's kind of regular. It may, maybe it's a more of an out here thing. I know a lot of um, like my clients and stuff around the country, they might be the only person there. But out in California, people are kind of spoiled because there's a lot of alumni running around or whatever. But, you know, when I would go to like Edison High School and like it was like 2005, didn't know what was going on. And the kids, you know, they just want to hang out at the beach and you're like trying to get them to care and you're like bringing the fire and they're like, yeah, I guess, whatever. You know, that, that vibe it all comes down to culture building. And I think the problem with once you already are struggling with a morale problem, it probably stems from an earlier, not building a culture of the kids being excited to be there or building a way of them feeling constant progress and many successes instead of always feeling beat down. And I think there is a, a beat down process that happens. And I was like that for many years where every rehearsal was like, I'm going to teach you the best I'm going to teach you so good. And then you teach the fun out of it. And then you're like aggressive teaching turns into an anti um, music thing for them because it just becomes this like, you will do my bidding. And if you don't, you will hear from it and I will embarrass you in front of the ensemble. And that's how you will learn to be tough. Yeah. And that is a first small group of people that works, but you have to have like sort of that sense of letting yourself be open to what your students need instead of bringing your agenda to them. You have to understand what this particular jellyfish of humans are like, what are they going to react to? If I do this, Oh, they scurried like, okay, too hot, too hot. Got to come in a little, a little cooler. Like, let's just see what their vibe is. And like, sometimes the first day of rehearsal, if I, when I was at a younger group, we would like, cool, let's like improvise a short piece. They don't have to worry about technique and they're having fun, they trust me because I'm just showing them things. And then we have like a little day where we do some listening, we do some music theory, and it becomes a more interesting thing beyond you need to get the task done. But if you're running behind and you're always in, we need to get the task done, and you never have time to build a culture, then you'll kind of always be fighting um, to keep the culture moving forward. It'll always live within certain all-star students, but it won't be the entire culture because you haven't made the time throughout the course of the year to constantly reinvigorate the excitement for music. You said it, and I think that's the word is culture. I think the morale and enthusiasm comes from the culture that you either have established in the program or hasn't yet been established or hasn't hasn't taken root the way that you want it to. So, um, you know, you have to look internally at this and go, if they're not responding to what I'm putting out there right now, how can I modify my approach? Um, you talked about, you know, this jellyfish of humans, and it, it's so apt because no two ensembles are ever the same. You know, like right. Chino Hills two years ago was different than Chino Hills three years ago, even though 75% of the membership was the same. Those right. kids are all a year older or a year younger. They have different interests, different priorities. And so you as an educator just constantly have to be on the ball about, um, you know, kind of taking the temperature of everything and establishing that culture where it becomes a family or it becomes, you know, this, this kinship among everybody. And then it really starts to transcend, oh, I've got to go to rehearsal. It becomes, right. I get to go spend time with people that I love working on something that I love doing. Um, and, and you as the leader, if you can um, you know, kind of wear your heart on your, your sleeve and show them the passion and the, the love and the care that you have for them as people beyond just them as executors of the show. Um, yes. Then they're eating out of the palm of your hand and, and you guys are working together to try to build something amazing. Yeah, I think um, I had some of um, the elder statesmen, you and Mike Jackson, a couple other people over the years, kind of like shed the wisdom of like caring about the students beyond their um, responsibilities for being in the ensemble as performers and caring more about like who they are as people and like being able to teach at the cadets um, with Ian Moyer and Colin McNutt and watching how like every day, they're like, hey man, how you doing today? Colin is like the most enthusiastic person, like random tuba player, how you feeling today, man? You feeling good? All right, great, we're doing this. And that sort of like electricity of really wanting the students to be pumped up for that 
it, it really does go a long way. And the energy you bring into the room that day when they see you is the energy they're going to mirror back to you. Even if they don't do it right away, if you consistently bring it and you energize them over time, you will start to have them all be on your vibe. Yep, absolutely. Hey, Ian, um, Terry had one follow-up question. We were talking about get away from the center, don't stand there. He was wondering, why do you think young instructors always gravitate towards the center of the ensemble? Is it just that they want to be near the stronger players? What, no. What's your thought on that? They just want to be able to press the button and start the rep and see the score, and they want to be able to, like, lay their stuff on the sub or whatever. I really think it's just, like, sometimes it's the simple economy of, like, oh, I can stand here, I can yell at everybody, I can basically hear when things are falling apart. Because I do think whenever I go to clean, I am always in the back row in the middle between my drum set, xylophone, center marimba. That is where all of my cleaning happens. Because if tempo's off here, there's nothing else I can do. So I will live there in certain instances. However, that is not the situation I see most people in. And I think there is um, just a lack of awareness of how much stronger you can get the ensemble sooner by evenly distributing the information. Because most of the time you don't realize that the vibes that you put on the outside are missing half their notes, playing all on the notes, and usually about an eighth note behind. And then when you finally realize it, you're like, oh my God, Julia, what are you doing? And in fact, Julia has not gotten any information. Yeah. I, and in general with percussion, look, this is a loud activity. Where you stand really matters because you're going to hear whatever is in closest proximity to you. I think we take our cues a lot from, I mean, historically, where is the conductor of the orchestra or the wind band? They're right. in the middle on the podium, very static, listening to everything. That is not the way that our percussion ensembles function. So I, I think we stand there because we think, okay, I'm in the middle of everything. I can hear everything. No, all you can hear are those couple of voices right next to you. Um, go listen to the show from different perspectives. Go stand next to different students so that you can be more in tune with how it's going for them. And then B, what do they need? What do they need to take a step forward mm -hmm. rather than just what a couple, you know, of the, the center of the main kids need? Um, I want to transition a little bit. We've gotten some great questions that have come in. I'm not even sure we're going to be able to get to all of these. But um, there's one here that I want to pick your brain on because it's related to something I wanted to ask you about. Um, Derek is wondering about your process for orchestrating music vertically mm -hmm. in the front ensemble. Where do you start and what voices slash instruments do you prioritize? And this is kind of related to something I wanted to pick your brain on, which is this concept of clarity of intent in our activity. Oh, man. Have that on the sheets. It's, it's on the composition side of the sheet, okay. not on the performance quality side. So it's a compositional consideration, which means we as the arrangers, as the composers, as the people putting together the soundtrack, we have to compose clearly. Um, can you right. talk a little bit about your process with all of that and what your thoughts are? Gladly. My favorite subject, and honestly, I think it's the subject that I most self-reflect on every possible second I get a chance. So let's just talk about um, what orchestration is, what arranging is, and what composition is, just really quickly, because I think everyone thinks they're interrelated more than they are as separate skills. So orchestration, I believe, is the craft and skill that takes the longest to master, because it really depends on knowing exactly what real instruments sound like in real time and not getting fooled by your sounds and your VDL playback and what you imagine it to be. But the reality of what does one single vibraphone actually sound like? What does a vibra slap sound like? What does the rivet cymbal sound like on VDL relative to when it's all the way over on side two and the rivets are all broken? I mean, there's all these things, but orchestration really comes down to knowing exactly what the reality is of what you're creating. Arranging and composing live more in the virtual reality concept, concept of like creating this music. And, you know, composition is for me is like the first one. And that is a much harder skill than most people consider because in composing, you need to be forethinking of the orchestration of the arranging and like, what is arranging? Well, how is that different? Because composer, arranger, aren't they the same? Well, arranging means essentially taking an existing piece of music and creating a form, song, event out of that piece of music. Composing is creating that piece of music from the beginning. Arranging is like creating an intro 
to a piece of music that already exists and then creating an outro that is a vamp. Composing is creating the harmonic language that will live on for the entire piece. And then arranging is figuring out, hmm, Woods should probably play in the beginning with maybe these instruments because that will be a cool sound and then there. A lot of people think that's orchestration. That's really just sound matching and you're kind of collecting sounds in a series um, horizontally, like moving through time. Um, so that's important to understand. So orchestration is the vertical understanding of any event that's happening at any given time and how those colors, for me, psychologically, affect the audience. And once I started conceiving of orchestration as a psychological effect, then I found that I had a lot less questions about who should play what, because I was already answering them before I started. So if you had like, you know, the piano in front of you, if you're visualizing a moment and you go to play something that sounds nice and open, um, this guy's not working now, let's see. So I have just this simple, then repeat. If I had something like that, okay, so I just played it on strings. We have no strings. So who's going to orchestrate that? How are we going to figure that out? Well, the most important thing psychologically I want the audience to hear is. Da, 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 da. So, okay, let's give that to vibes. Uh-oh, the first note's a G, which means. We can't take it up the octave, so because the vibe's highest note is an F. So now, orchestrationally considering, I know that if I start in C, Lydian, G, F sharp, E, D, C sharp, I know right away that if I want that melody to sing in the high metals, the highest note of that melody is already going to be out of the range that I want. That's just a quick demonstration of understanding, like, when I'm composing, and thinking the orchestration is somewhat in the distance, but I don't think we need to consider it too much. So let's get back to the task at hand of really talking now about orchestration specifically as it relates to clarity of intent. Clarity of intent is also essentially, and I think this is the best way to put it, clarity of intent is, for better or worse, what you want the audience to hear on a very first read with no prior information. And is that a good thing or a bad thing, assuming that you only get one read? Yes, you have to write it like you get one read because in Ohio, you get one read and you could be done. You can't be like, no, but when you hear it the second time, you'll be like, oh, I get it. You did a really loud bass drum gong. Then this thing I can't hear comes in. You can't explain yourself after the fact. So clarity of intent for me, although it says like the clear and balanced intent of the written score and all this stuff, it's really, comes down to you as when you're creating the music, what do you want someone to absolutely hear perfectly on a first read? That's like the nuts and bolts of it without getting super crazy. If you just wrote that down, like, what do I want someone to hear on a first read? And then you go, okay, it's the snare solo. All right. So you want them to hear the snare solo. Why do you have all these other things written in the same competing frequency with the same amount of density if you actually want them to hear the snare solo? Well, but I'm the front ensemble guy. I had to show my metals colors. That's in my arrangement. That's where everything goes shimmery. Like, yeah, shimmery gets in the way of diddlies. If diddlies and shimmeries are happening at the same time, diddlies are much less clear. So at that point, you realize you might have made an arranging or orchestration error. And then you just need to go, okay, let's take that shimmery thing. Let's put it in a place where there's not diddlies. And now we're like making smarter arranging choices based on creating orchestration that's clearer vertically. And that is like a very simple, like bone dry example, but you see this happen all the time when one person's idea of what the audience wants to hear, AKA the battery arranger, is different than what the front ensemble wants the audience to hear because the front ensemble arranger is also trying to flex their fancy muscles. And when both arrangers are essentially trying to take the stage at the same time, that is where all of the clarity of intent errors come from by not creating primary and secondary importance. And as soon as you create which voice is 100% primary, everything else then becomes subservient to helping that sound and almost all of your questions will get answered by themselves.
Love it. Fantastic. Hey, a um, couple of questions that have come in that I think we can um, kind of knock out pretty quickly. Bill was wondering this, when you have a few designers, does it ever become too many chefs in the kitchen? Always. <laughs> it, you know, it depends on what stage of the process you're in. I think when you're in the brainstorming process, the more the better at some ways, but I remove myself as realistically John removes me from the process in the beginning to make sure I'm not like just poking at everything like, Oh yeah, that's stupid. That's stupid. Don't do that. That's going to break. Don't do that. Um, and then when you are, uh, all listening to the ensemble, I think it is possible to have too many people. Um, when you're trying to make like big picture mix things, I really just want everyone to just kind of shut up and let me do my thing, to be honest. Then once I'm like, okay, now at this point, I think this is pretty good. What do you think? And maybe just talk to one person because no two people are ever going to agree on the mix really. But all you need is kind of like one or two people making those big decisions as you hone in on it. And then eventually maybe take someone else's advice, but you can very easily talk your way into a circle with three people. And then someone else suggests like, Oh, well, what if we took the bass note out? Or what if we did this? What if we did that? Um, I just had this uh, thing the other day at Pulse, and it was super awesome. We had um, Fred Smith come out, an amazing film composer, and I just wanted to have like fun with him for the day. And he came out to work with the group, and he threw out some suggestions, and then we were going through it. And then he's like, you know, just take it with a grain of salt. I was like, no way, we're doing everything. And then like, I got to rehearsal the next day, and I was like, take all that out. Go back to the way I had it before. Okay, I like that better. And that's totally okay. But if you had six people all on the design team saying, no, that sample should be on count two, this should be that. And then the next thing you know, the roles are clouded and it gets a little weird. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another question for you. Uh, Garrett is wondering, when designing a show, how do you know if it's good, absent validation from a third party? Do you just know or is there some risk and some guesswork involved? What is it for you? Okay. One, ask yourself, is this group of kids the vehicle for this concept to bring it to its absolute fruition? Number two, is this a show you want to do or is it a show that's really good for the group? Number three, is the audience going to care or want to see it or is it just, again, back to number two, about you? That will cover most of the bases. And number four is like, trust your gut. If you feel like it might be a weird show, it's probably a weird show. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure you can be much more brilliant than that. If your gut says, eh, I'm not sure about this, maybe go yeah. a different direction on that. Yeah, I think the, the more, if I could go back and tell myself anything, it'd be trust your instincts a little bit more. Yeah. And also, I would say, you know, embrace the fact that not every show is going to be the greatest thing you've put together. Um, you want to try to make every show unique and you want to make it special for that group of performers that year, um, but you're not going to hit it out of the park every single time. So just as, as somebody that is putting something creative out in the universe, understand that you're going to take some lumps along the way. Uh, yeah. And that's part of the creative process. I think most people at the top of the activity will tell you that, um, you know, it comes in ebbs and flows, things like that. Yeah, and I think you have to dig in once you do make the show and make that version of that show the best it can be, and then have really honest self-reflection after that's done and make a list of all the things that didn't work and make them the things that you improve on the next year. And then even if that next year isn't as successful on paper, like for me, I feel like even last year, I look at the Pulse show and I go like, oh, why would I write anything like that? You idiot, you fool. I feel like way more informed now because my process of like reinvention and self-evaluation, I'm always checking more boxes and going, researching how to create new like clarity and sound so that I hear old errors, even from a year or two ago, and I'm like, yeah, I like that, but I love what I'm doing now more only because I'm always trying to outdo myself in not competitively, just as an artist of creating something that is more informed and less accidental. And I want things to be happening consistently on purpose because I know what I'm doing instead of waiting for, you know, the magic roll of the dice. Right. So well, and I think that's true for all artists. Anybody that's, that's doing creative work, if you read any biographies of any famous artist, no matter what their medium is, they'll all tell a similar story about this. So it's just part of the journey of people that are trying to be creative and put something fresh and unique out there in the world. Um, kind of on that note of artists, Tommy is wondering um, where your compositional motivation comes from. Are there certain people that you look up to and take inspiration from? Um, is it a particular composer? Is it a collection of movies? Where does that come from for you? 
Oh yeah, super easy. Like all of my big ones, John Williams, Danny Elfman, um, Stravinsky, uh, WC, um, Holst. And those are like, like just the immediate right off the bat. But then like, there's also like the entire genre of like pop, hip hop, all of that stuff because of like the way I grew up listening to like D'Angelo and listening to like all this stuff that like when the Voodoo album came out for D'Angelo, my brain got rocked and I had never heard these like sort of broken beat, sort of Jay Dilla inspired type things. So I had a wide range of stuff and I was also really into steel drum and Brazilian music and all of these things. So I don't think I have like one particular composer. Um, it's that I have all of my deep influences that I, when I need to pull out that card, when I need to feel like something needs to feel like interstellar and magical, I pull out the Holst card and I go like, all right, buddy, me and you. And I have my planet score that has post-it notes from like every trip I've ever taken. And usually like if I'm on a plane, I have my post-it notes and a pencil and I'll be listening to Holst and I'm analyzing the score in the plane. And I might get through like most of, you know, Saturn or something in one trip. And then after a course of five or six years, most of the scores will have notes in them. And I might never reference them or they might live in my brainstem as something that will come back. But I think it's important to constantly be absorbing things that have nothing to do with drumline. Um, because I think the way to stay innovative is be aware of trends and things that are being successful because they're effective, not being successful because like, oh, I've never seen anyone do that before. I'm gonna spin my marimbas round two. You know, when, uh, I think when Rhythm X won um, way back in the day, everyone was like, oh my God, I have to do the most incredible physical feats. They didn't realize that like it was successful because Rhythm X was amazing at it. It wasn't successful just because they wanna see you like walk across snare drums or do all these incredible feats. And they kind of like didn't see it in context. And like right now, I feel, I feel like there's a massive trend moving forward of small ensemble playing to create clarity of intent. And honestly, that's a result of the acoustic environment we're in. It, it sounds way better when less people are playing and the clarity of intent comes through. I don't think it's a trend that's like, hey man, it's super cool to just have the snares. Like, no, it sounds really good if you wanna assess the snare drums in a boomy environment to take all the other crap out and just be able to listen to them and hear that purity of sound. So. Those are the trends I watch for in the activity and that I allow to influence me. But the compo composing and all that, I like to live more and like, I mean, there's so much to get from the masters. I mean, if you haven't heard like the Howard Hansen symphonies, um, so much of that is where a lot of the John Williams stuff um, came from. And you can go on Amazon, check out, I think it's Howard Hansen symphony number two. Go listen to the recording, watch the score, your mind's gonna be blown. And right now you're probably going, who the heck's Howard Hansen? Go check it out, it's amazing. And that kind of stuff might inform something completely out of context for your show, but there's a color you're gonna hear because right now on the radio, everything sounds the same, it's all in the same key. There's not a lot of really inspiring things happening anywhere on the radio right now, unless you are doing a sort of vibey ambient pop thing. But if you're developing, you know, sort of Western thematic music that is sort of classical, neoclassical, romantic, whatever it is in nature, you gotta go back. Yep. Definitely. Um, did you ever feel burned out on creating or composing earlier in your career? Earlier? How about yesterday? What there are you talking go. about earlier? You know, there is um, a benefit that I have that I do not take for granted that over many years I cultivated a position that I could only, or that I would only take on what I felt comfortable I could create. Um, and I got really lucky and making the right gamble early on to build up box six and create um, a, a stream of revenue that allows me to only have to write X amount per year and then put the hustle in everywhere else. Um, I also don't do arrangements for people at all. I don't do any fall arrangements of like, hey man, we're doing Rhapsody in Blue. Like, oh, great, more, yeah, you're gonna, the clarinet's probably gonna be bad, right? Okay, sweet, I'll do something. Um, I don't have to do that. And so I have the ability to say no. However, when I was younger, I would do a lot of arrangements for other people. Um, but I found that multiple arrangements for multiple people bring the money in completely sucked my creativity out. And I just, I got really lucky and I was able to find a way to invest deeper in creativity so that there was more molten lead that was super dense in what I was creating. And I wasn't just fanning out my 
music as far as it could possibly reach just to try to get all the money to roll in. And I think you have to be really careful with that because if you don't have the chops, then everyone knows you suck because you sent all your stuff out to everybody and your parts are sloppy and things don't really make sense. You're like, but I got all this money. Like that will not last. You will not have a career that lasts if you throw garbage out in the universe. It will cycle back around and land on your front lawn. And I think it's important to only put out a product that's quality that you can say like, yeah, that's even though that's my worst product, I'm still super proud of it. Yeah. So I, I think with most things, you know, balance is key in all of this. Mm -hmm. And uh, finding a way for you to just kind of sharpen the saw, step away from the activity a little bit and come back with um, zest and enthusiasm and excitement and passion for this is so important. That's difficult to do if you're hustling and arranging for everybody all the time and you're constantly under deadline. That's the yeah. quickest way to burn out. And I think you, uh, the most important thing, and, I, and I've always done this, I, you always have to have, for me, I have to have like a tandem skill that I'm learning as a new thing to get into my life. Right now, it was like, it would have been learning the ukulele and the guitar, which I never learned how to play. And before that, it was tennis. And before that, I was like working as a card magician. And before that, there was always some weird, crazy thing that I would get on my kick because I needed that sort of skill building to keep me sane as like I was focused on one thing. I needed to have another thing so I could be reminded of what it felt like for something to be fresh again. How do you come in and teach kids how to do something you already know how to do if you can't even remember what it's like not to do how, not how to do something, you know what I mean? So to be terrible at tennis was like being terrible at marimba and not knowing how it works. And I grew more sympathetic and understanding for the students and then also more frustrated at how bad I was at tennis. So the two <laughs> helped inform each other of how to be a more well-rounded human and that really helped the burnout um, especially a couple years ago when I was really uh, burning the candle at both ends. Yep, yep. Um, I have one more question for you kind of on the like arranging design front, and then I want to change gears and talk about a couple of other things. And several people wrote in with, with similar questions to this. So this kind of kind of be a response to, uh, to Derek and to uh, David and to uh, one other person. And, and so here's my question for you. Yes. What advice... <laughs> What advice would you have for young aspiring arrangers to help them learn the craft and take a step forward in this field? Somebody that's starting out and they look at you and they look at the work that you've done and they're like, I want to do this. I want to be great at this. What advice do you have for people that are getting started? Do your homework. Everyone wants an answer. Like, oh, is there like a thing? Is there a, is there a food I can eat? What's the food that I need to like? And then I'll tell people like, well, you know, you really have to like transcribe a lot of music. Have you transcribed much music? No, I haven't done that. But that sounds like a really good idea. Oh, you got to buy a lot of scores. You got to study scores. Have you done any score study? Man, I'm saving the money. That's, that's a really good idea. Okay, so um, you got to just go and observe people teaching. You got to do that. Oh, man, I'm totally going to come by. Never comes by. Um, you got to get all of the recordings of all your favorite artists and really dig in and write down a list of all the things that you love about that. Oh man, that's, that's a great idea. I should do that. You should go on YouTube and find out all of these people that teach you the basics of composing and arranging. Oh man, yeah, I'm totally going to do that. And nobody ever does it. That is the real hard answer is you actually have to do the work that someone suggests that you do. And there is so much incredible information on YouTube. And it's like, we can Google everything in the world, but then sometimes we're just waiting for someone to give us that motivation to do it. And like what I did when I needed to figure out how to do all this, I spent about $3,000 on Amazon. I got a personal loan from the bank and I spent a year and a half sitting in a room with no teacher. And I read through every possible orchestration and arranging book. And I sat in a room and taught myself how to write for wins for like maybe 10 to 12 hours a day. And that was like right before we launched box six. And so I essentially took myself back to school with this hyper intensive training. And this was way before all the resources of YouTube and everything else were out there. And I was willing to invest the money and take the risk that this might not pay off. And there's no substitute for that insane amount of work that goes in and the grind. It's like, how do I get really good roles? Like, well, you work on your roles a lot a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, and then you get a teacher and work on it a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, and then you'll still be not as great as you want and you keep going and it's just like anything else, but there's no substitute for already having put in the grind. If you haven't even started the grind, you wouldn't even know what 
the information was that you're looking for when you got it. I love it. That, that is it's so incredibly well stated. And uh, I think a perfect way to end on that particular note and that particular part. All right, I wanna shift um, Ian now to talking a little bit about um, some logistics, um, ensemble management things. Oh my favorite. kinds of things, stuff like that. Okay. All right, so here's my first question. I wanna talk drum corps with you. Um, mm. And this question was sent in by somebody sent an email ahead of time. They work with an independent ensemble and have recently been really struggling with the fact that They've got members that are getting called back three or four times for auditions. Um, they have multiple students that are auditioning for multiple different cores. And so uh, she was really lamenting the fact that she hasn't had a full group rehearsal since November. Um, mm -hmm. And I know between Pulse and POW, um, you've got uh, similar things with the groups that you work with. How do you handle all that? How do you make it work? What advice do you have? What perspective can you share? You know, it's, it's really difficult because depending on what tier your ensemble is in, that student might be trying out for a lot of different groups. But the thing that we try to adopt with the students as far as the culture building within the Pulse organization was have your top pick and have your backup plan. After that, we need you at rehearsal. And then within those groups, you need to figure out what your game plan is, how often you need to be there, look at your schedule. And we have to put it on the members too to do the communication because as a director, you can't be going around calling attendance for everybody, <laughs> trying to figure out who's going on what and where. So what we did was created a, a Google doc that all of the students fill out their drum corps attendance problems so that we can get a wider view and look back on what the ensemble game plan is every week. Like, okay, we're gonna be missing three out of the five bass drums. So let's just do no bass drums this weekend. And then we still make sure we have efficient rehearsals, even when we're missing people. But you need to get way ahead of this stuff. And you really need to, even when the members are auditioning, we ask them, where, what drum corps are you auditioning for? And if they say so-and-so and so-and-so, we're like, hey, just so you know, that drum corps is particularly picky about audition camps. And we have this performance that you can't miss. So you should know that now, because once it comes up to that, that could be, you know, uh, a deciding factor for you. Yep, I think that's great. Great advice in that um, in that realm. Um, specific to rehearsal, when you are out there, you're working with students, you're standing in the trenches. We were talking about this earlier, you know, move around the ensemble and stand in different places. Joseph was wondering, what are some good ways to ensure that players have an understanding of how to genuinely listen to the ensemble rather than being distracted by executing the music? So um, awareness mm -hmm. and, and the ability to, you know, kind of open up their ears and take in the music making rather than just focusing on executing your part. What advice do you have for him? I have the best advice ever. You have to teach that to them in their exercises. Everything we do in music has to be taught in the exercises and very rarely are we teaching the exercises with the same amount of specificity, musicality, and attention to detail in their exercises. The things they play every day. I walk into every group and the mallets ups, uh, like when I go and travel and see, not necessarily my groups, but just groups in general, I can tell with the mallets up that everything they're about to play is going to be bad. You know, the mix isn't figured out. The synths don't have patches for the warmups. The drum set's not tuned. All of these things that you've subconsciously been telling your students, hey, exercises, you don't have to have like that great. Music, you better play it so good. Like, so the kids know like, okay, now I'm going to pretend to play music. And then exercises, I'm just hanging out, waiting to go pretend to play music. Music has to be either all in or all out or put your mallets down and go home. And so I make sure that any listening that I can do in the exercises, in the first day that they play the instruments, we're talking about like, what does it sound like? Obviously, once we got to get the proper motor skills happening. But if I can teach the students how to really hear, what does mezzo piano actually sound like? How do you play at three inches and still hear How can you hear that? Try it with soft mallets, try it with hard mallets. Let's hear every other player playing no metronome. Let's do all of these things that force the student to come out of their norm. And the best way to do that is pull the met out of the exercises, watch them fumble and try and figure it out, and then give them very exact information about what they need to do to listen better. And the best way you can do that is by walk around and hear what their errors are instead of just assuming they're making an error. But you can walk over to side one, hey vibes, check it out. We're gonna do that again. Nobody play, everyone just listen. 
they play through it one time you go what can you hear xylophone like so what should you listen for xylophone high five we're moving on and it, it can be that symbol that all of a sudden you've literally passed the torch of knowledge on to the student by giving them an easy environment for them to understand now when there's all this stuff that they're reacting to the battery speeding up something weird happened with the count off they at least have some groundwork to build on. But if you don't give them the language of listening, then they're just going to be struggling through the handbook trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah, I think the big key for, the big key for this is turning your students from the um, those that are executing the parts to people that are um, examining what that is that they're doing during the course of the show. So I think uh, a lot of the time, as Ian mentioned, during exercises, that tends to be for a lot of ensembles, and I'm guilty of this early in my career, um, very passive time. We're getting the hands loose. We're, we're working on some fundamental thing that does not engage the brain in a very active process. There's a way to, without spending any extra time, have a conversation with your students and orient their brains a little bit differently. Yes, we are trying to physically get warmed up and loose right now, but what can you be doing cognitively during this process? What are you doing orally with your ears during this? What are we listening for? Um, what are we using to kind of inform our understanding as musicians? That's huge and that's key. Um, I then think the other aspect of this is there's, there's a saying that says, um, what gets inspected gets expected. And I think that's really in, important for our rehearsals and for our performances is um, inspecting certain things about what students are doing, um, not just executing the notes and the rhythms on their instrument. Was that a right note? Was that in time? Was it clean? But instead, does this line up with this? Is this? Um, is this complementary to this other thing? Once they know that you're listening to that and you're asking about that, they start to expect that of themselves as well. If they don't ever hear that from you and it's just something you're doing and you're listening to the sound profile of the ensemble, you're not teaching students to be evaluative of their own sound. You're teaching them just to execute and then you'll tell them when the execution is wrong. Right. Uh, and there's a lot that we can do to empower our students to be a little bit more self-reflective and be a little bit more observant of the things that happen around them. Not, not visually, we do that all the time. Uh, you know, check your heights and that stuff, but observant sonically of everything that's happening around you. Um, mm -hmm. So key and so crucial. Um, let's see, okay, so I wanna kind of take us to the home stretch on this, Ian. We've answered most of the questions that have come in, um, but I wanna pick your brain specifically on this. We're recording this right now on January 30th. Um, Many ensembles across the country have had their debut sometime within the last week or so, maybe. I know a couple of your ensembles did that last weekend. Um, most other ensembles are scheduled to make their debut sometime over the next couple of weekends. Mm -hmm. What is your personal philosophy early in the season? Are you all about um, getting from the beginning to the end of the, the, get the beginning to the end of the production on the floor as quickly as possible? Or do you like to perform smaller segments that are a little bit more refined, a little bit more filled in and then gradually add pieces throughout the course of the season. You know, I think as a direct result of having our closest competitors right down the street from us, we don't have the freedom to throw something out that's a mess. We have to bring out polished, ready to rock because the expectation is that now. Mm -hmm. And I think that in the beginning, you know, we could come out in like 2012, Pulse came out in like jeans, black shirt, that was this coming and going show. And at the very first show, uh, this person was holding a battery pack that was about this big. And on top of that was a disco ball that was glowing lights. And that was like this thing that was like the spirit that eventually turned into a human being. And there was all this stuff. But like at the first show, we're like, yeah, whatever. And then we saw that, we're like, man, we look really terrible. <laughs> RCC came out and destroyed us. We were like, dang, we can't do that anymore. Um, so I believe now our process has really been to teach the living crap out of it um, from the very beginning. Um, in particular, like this year at Pulse, uh, the, the front ensemble intro, once they get going, is hyper intricate with all these heights and all these things. And I was like, guys, I want you to take this half tempo. Here's your video assignments. And for two weeks, we camped out on this like 16 bars of music. Like, no, no, this has to be exactly right because I knew we were not gonna to get to relearn this, but I also knew 100% that this is gonna be the final part we play in Ohio. When you don't know if this is gonna be the final part you play in Ohio, and I will say, having written for many years, I know when something is like, you might change this, and I know when it's like, this is right the first time. You might not always know that. However, 
I think it's important to learn everything right the first time when you can. And I think laying out a visual structure that is without too much detail, and obviously I don't do the visual, but John gets things staged, makes sure the staging is right before any detail goes in, and then the detail goes in as the next layer so we can actually ensemble this stuff in real time. Um, knowing that there's gonna be some blank spots for sure, but you have to map the progress out so that you don't get through the whole thing then have to go back and relearn the whole thing as muscle memory with new body. You know, anything that you can learn as simultaneous muscle memory of what will really be happening in context at the end, if you can get that in earlier, the students are gonna be better for it. Well, we know that musically too. We don't teach, you know, first we're gonna learn the rhythms, then we're gonna learn all the notes, later we'll worry about the dynamics, and then sticking will come live. We don't do that. We, we get the whole thing, yep. we're talking about from the beginning. So it makes sense to kind of extrapolate that out and make that part of the whole entire show. Um, can you share with us approximately how much do your ensembles have on the floor right now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Pulse right now has five and a half minutes on the floor, really pretty much all completely filled in. And then we have about another minute 45 to two minutes-ish, and then we'll be done in there actually learning that this week. Um, Powell has a little bit less than that, and Chino Hills has a little bit less than that in like the four and a half to five minute range. And essentially everyone is getting their closer music this week. So that's probably not done uh, for a while. For yeah, a, I'm gonna rough right. it out. That's probably like 75, 80% of the show on the floor right now, which right. I'm sure is not as great as you want it to be in terms of the excellence and all that stuff. But um, <laughs> it's not bad. Okay, it's pretty good. You guys heard it here. It's pretty that's good. Thing. Yeah, yeah it's good it's about it. well, Pulse and Powell had to perform. So that's the benefit of the preview show is not just like a, hey, everyone give us a high five. Like, no, you guys got to be show ready. Your right. peers are going to be there. Everyone wants to see you. And like, you got to bring the heat. And we yeah. tell them, like the preview show for them is the most important show of the year, except for finals, because the preview show dictates the tone for the rest of the season. And it's so important to have the psychological factor. And I think so many people forget about what the member psychology is. And you want to talk about like morale and building a culture. That's the psychology of understanding how to get your season started right. And the feeling and the confidence a member can go into a show knowing that they're properly prepared. And like, I am never going to send my students out for something they're not prepared for. And I tell them that every year. I was like, I will never send you to perform something you're not ready to do. I will give you everything. I can't guarantee you will do it, but I will make sure that when you push onto that floor, you're like, no, I can do this for sure. And they have trust in me after X amount of years with me and the ensemble that we're never going to put them in a position that they're going to fail exponentially. They might fail decently, but. Fail up. They do a good yeah, job. Exactly. Um, you mentioned something about like you have these shows done. They're, they're complete compositionally and design process, at least in terms of all the planning and things like that. And I think that's so important, even though you're not, you know, prepared to perform the full thing at the very first show in February, um, that the show is done and you essentially know what the ending is going to look like, sound like, and feel like. Um, you know, mid-March is not the time to be figuring that out and go, oh no. gosh, we got a problem. This does not end and conclude. Well, sometimes that still happens. Yeah, that still happens sometimes. But like, even, you know, for, for Townsend Junior High, um, that closer is done. You know what I mean? That music has been finished and, you know, making sure that even the junior high kids, especially they can't do a second draft. Like I, you know, last year in particular, I don't know if you got to see the innovations of the eighties show. I did. I loved it. It was so much fun, but dude, that thing was so hard to write. Oh my God. I spent more time on chunks of the Townsend show than I did of like, now, not like full movements, but there's certain things that I had to create and event-based things in junior high world that took longer to physically like create and write and sculpt than some of the stuff at world, in world class because it had to be right the first time. Yeah. And it had to be just the right skill level for the students. And people really underestimate the challenge of writing extremely effective but easy to learn parts for younger players. And I think there's just this expectation that like, oh, well, the kids, they just, they couldn't learn it. It's like, well, you look at the parts, you kind of wrote it super awkward. Mount positions are weird. You didn't repeat any patterns. You literally like made it difficult without knowing that you were making it difficult. Yeah. No, I, I, it's one of the things whenever I get a chance to talk in soapbox about this, it's one of the biggest pieces of advice I have is that a lot of times people think, you know, like, oh, you got to be so great and perfect with world class 
Um, and then the A-class stuff, like you can kind of take your time. And, no, it's the opposite of that. Opposite. Um, world-class performers can recover so much more quickly. So if you make a mistake or if you go, we're going like, to try and experiment. This movement, I don't know if this is going to work. We've got to try some things. Right. If it doesn't go well, they can recover. They can learn something new in a heartbeat. Um, your, your basic performers, they do not have enough reps possible to be able to recover with some of those mistakes. So it's even more important that you're early on in the design process, early on in the development process, and getting that show out and complete and on the floor as quickly as possible so they have a chance to refine and get really comfortable and really right. confident. Um, that's something that you know advanced performers are going to be able to do. They're going to be able to bring the confidence. The, our A-class performers, even some of our open-class performers, they Dude. need the time to let it marinate and get comfortable to be there. Yeah, so the key to like great performances is managing personal CPU overload or conservation of mental energy. People don't understand that like, yes, in a calm environment, your student's CPU load is like, my brain's at 75%. I have 25% left to calculate what happens if we speed up, slow down. Now you push Junior into the gym and he's completely shut down. He can't respond, nothing happens and everything blows up. It's like, well, you need to have him operating in the best environment at like, 50% CPU load. He needs to be able to do the whole show like 50% energy and not make mistakes. Then when like something goes wrong and the nerves get going, when that meter starts rising up to like 80, 90, there's not like an explosion. And so many people think like, man, I don't know why we had a bad show. The rehearsal was so great. It's like, well, how many times did you have a great rehearsal? Once? That's not enough CPU buffer. <laughs> you need to get that buffer way down. Right. Absolutely. It, they have to be so confident that there's, you know, your the chance of error is as close to 0% as possible. We're not trying to roll the die and go like 40% chance. Maybe it doesn't work. No. We got to get that down to zero. Um, People would always ask like, what was the secret at Pacifica? Beat downs. So many reps. That's back when we used to like rehearse at the SCPA shows for like three hours in the sun and everyone would be like, God, you guys are brutal. It's like, we need the reps, more reps. We only got two snares. They can't play roles, more reps. And that was the only way we could create confidence was through sheer brutality and muscle memory over like just relentless reps. And he means that in the most educational way possible. Of course. <laughs> um, Nick was wondering how you balance putting out more show content during this time of the year versus cleaning the show. Do you have any advice or any perspectives on that? Mm, content as in what do you, I'm uh, adding on more show. So you've got like oh, a minute, minute right. and a half still yeah. to go. Um, so right now what we're doing is we're kind of in this space where we're going to be learning the closer, but we're not going to be performing it until like probably the regional meaning like, the show that Pulse performs at their first show, which is next weekend, will be the same show we did at the preview show probably, but we'll simultaneously be learning the rest of the chunks that we want so that as soon as that show's done, we'll already go back into the music we were kind of learning before. So much like in drum corps where you might be learning a chunk of music you won't perform the next day, but it just helps you troubleshoot and get through the music a little bit more. So it's not like, okay, first time playing the new music, you have to learn it in three days, good luck. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, many of us know from experience, a world-class group can usually do both things at the same time. We can be right. working on cleaning and refining things or we're also learning more things and, and trying to put out more content. Um, I think for some of our ensembles that, where that would be really tough. Well, I'll just share this. Um, I, this is one of the things I struggled with. During this part of the year, we are learning show, learning show, learning show, trying to make progress, trying to get um, a, a respectable amount out to perform at our debut, whenever that is. And my intent would be, we're gonna have this first performance, and then right after this, we're gonna keep on going with like staging the rest of this thing, getting everything else out there, trying to like get the whole show on the floor. And the first show would happen, and it wouldn't go well, and I would get feedback from the judges about all the things that they're doing poorly, and I would abandon all of my plans, and I would go into, right gotta fix it, we gotta make it right. We gotta take yeah. what we have right now and clean it because we got another competition in two weeks and then like the season can get away from you. If you yeah, so. you gotta have the long vision because those first shows don't matter. They don't. And I, I think there's three, well, there's technically four phases in my process. Learning the first time, which has to be done right. Then there's the first phase of cleaning, which means they played it enough that they can kind of like play it and cleaning like audibly. I know exactly what you're trying to do. 
then producing. And this is where people fail. You got to make this sound awesome. You can't tell people that the music's going to sound awesome. They don't know that it, what it sounds like in your head. You have to spend time in the early process making your mix sound right. Then there's the re-clean where you actually make it like finals ready clean, but you have to do that four step process for every single chunk of music. There's two cleaning blocks. There's the first cleaning one that really gets it more close. Then you have to produce it and get the reps in. And then you can't do real cleaning until you've done the other three things. And some people try to do the super clean right after they just learned it. And I'm like, what are you doing? They're not even going to play it like that two months from now. Right. They're not ready for it yet. They're in no. the developmental cycle. We are not getting this finals clean right now. That's not what ha yeah. what's happening. So yeah, I love that advice. All right, Ian, we're going to kind of take this thing home. I have a couple of final questions for you to wrap right. everything up. Um, this one is about, well, I'll just, I'll read the question for you. This is a competitive activity. Um, everybody is an artist and is trying to bring a unique flavor to the floor, but we're doing it through this vehicle of competing. I mean, we publish scores and placements and rankings and all that other kind of stuff. So that means everybody is out trying to crack the code on the secret to success. What do I do to be one place higher? What do I do to bump the score by a couple of points? Um, what do you think, from your perspective, what do we need to do as a collective activity to make sure that we are avoiding the activity becoming homogenized because we're all trying to chase the competitive secret to success? Well, I think that there are certain factors that get rewarded because they're really good. Like what I was referring to before, like reducing the orchestration to maximize clarity of intent so that on a first read, someone can tell what the players are actually doing. Um, that is going to somewhat homogenize the scoring because mass ensemble playing is going to be reduced. That's kind of a nature of the environment that we're in acoustically. I don't think it's necessarily like an aesthetic choice. Same thing in DCI because of Lucas Oil and the inability to read things that become densely orchestrated versus when you used to be able to hear everything outdoors, that's changing that way. Um, I think right now there's a lot of diversity in the way that like Rhythm X puts a show together, MCM puts a show together, RCC puts a show together, and then you start moving down the line and then you see George Mason and you see Monarch and you see this POW and you see this wide range of diversity. And then I think you can look at Scholastic World and see a pretty wide range of diversity as well. If you look at something from top to bottom of like a James Logan show, a um, uh, like an Arcadia show, and then you look at all of the groups that are in between that. You look at the variety that Ayala brings to the table every year. And then you look at what Avon can do and you look at all this stuff. And I guess you could say it's getting homogenized in that sense, but I still feel like, I don't know, maybe my lens is so used to seeing indoor percussion that I see way more gradients to the spectrum than like someone from the outside. Cause like, well, everyone's doing vocals. Everyone's got them fancy costumes and everyone's doing modern dance and everyone starts with a body intro. That might be like their version of everything being homogenized. But I mean, I guess until someone does something that's so revolutionary, it like changes the game. I'm certainly not overly concerned with what everyone else is doing to be totally honest. I think we just need everyone as creators to be doing the best version of themselves. You're not going to out pulse pulse. You're not going to out broken city, broken city. You're not going to out RCC, RCC. So I think as long as groups, I think we see a lot of homogenization maybe in the mid to lower tiers as groups are emulating the, the groups that they enjoy. Um, and then there's a couple groups that'll come out like a couple years ago, Cap City did this super crazy, awesome visual show. And I had no idea what was going on in a good way. Like the pacing was so interesting. There was these alien ladies that popped out. And I was like, this doesn't feel like an indoor drumline show. This is really cool. I, I enjoy this variety, regardless of where they place. When Strike did the King Kong show, oh my God. That was like, I was up on top of the roof screaming and the judges maybe, you know, decided where that should have sat. And I'm not even saying they should have placed higher, but I think if people are putting their hat of like the activity has to be based on my group's success, then it is going to be homogenized. If you're comfortable being who you are and not super worried about the placements, like everyone, you know, would like to say they are, then do what you got to do and be stoked on it and build a culture with your group that they trust you enough that they're not in it to win it. You know? 
Well, and I think that's as true for our A and our open class ensembles as it is for world. I would agree with you. I think we have a lot of diversity in the activity. I mean, no, look no further than the finalists in Scholastic World or Independent World. And, and like, it's this huge array of these different approaches and different ways and pathways to go in terms of programming and, and producing a show. Um, that should be true up and down all of our classes. So I think there's room for everybody to go, what do I want to say in this activity? What can my students bring to life? And I'm gonna go that direction mm. rather than, oh, here's the thing that seems to be trending. Let me go that right. direction. Um, one of the, the best lessons I ever learned in the activity is when everybody starts to go right, if you go left, you're the one thing that looks and sounds different. And you now all of a sudden stand out in this field of sameness. Mm -hmm. If everybody does that, everybody goes their own direction, we have really diverse and robust um, and really jamming activity. I think that's key. Right. I mean, like, you, if you look at something like when MCM can come out and they, like, they do something that's so incredible and everyone thinks they're going to copy them, like rotating the marimbas, and everyone realizes, like, that was too damn hard. Nobody could do that. Never mind. It gets scratched off the list. And then it just right. misses this amazing outlier anomaly that they made the sacrifice to invest so much into that. And they were like, we knew we're making some sacrifices, but we believe in it. It's great. That sort of passion is what's going to keep the activity fresh. People willing to like go to that extreme length to do that, you know? All right. Final question for tonight. Wrap it up on this. Can you please share with us? What is one thing that you wish you could tell the younger version of yourself? What have you learned over the years that if you could go back in time, um, you would share back and, and change and modify that. What advice do you have for people that you've learned through these years? Hmm. Um, be patient, diversify yourself, and trust yourself. I love it. So well stated. Ian, thank you so much for joining us and having this conversation with us tonight. There is so much great knowledge um, and insight and, and clear passion and enthusiasm for what you do and for the performers that you work with and the designers that you collaborate with. I really appreciate you sharing all of that with everybody tonight. Thanks so much for having me, Caleb. This total pleasure, total blast. Time flew by like crazy. And I, I'm very honored to be here with you guys. Uh, absolutely, man. Um, I want to thank everybody that's tuning in live with us tonight. We had a huge turnout for this, which is fantastic. Um, I know a lot of people are also going to be watching a recorded version of this later on down the road. Um, just uh, a mention in case you, you find your way to this video at some point and you're going, where do I find more of these things? We will post all of these videos on the WGI website, usually like a day after these things air live. Um, the, the WGI office, Amy, does a great job turning them around really quickly. The place that you can go to find these is WGI.org. Go to the percussion area, go down to resources, and go to the videos tab. And that's where you'll find uh, the webinars this season but we also have the archives of all the webinars from the past couple of years. So um, season is just getting started. Now is a great time to get up to speed. If you've missed any of them over the last couple of years, some great stuff. The next webinar that we're going to be doing is going to be on February 20th. It's going to feature Terry Sanders. Um, I'm nice. sure Terry and I are going to have a fantastic conversation. We're going to be talking about uh, all of his experience as a designer, as an educator, and then also his experience as an adjudicator been able to see the activity from a lot of different perspectives over a lot of years. Um, so I'm really excited to be able to get a chance to talk with him. Everybody that attended and came on out and, uh, and, and tuned in with us tonight, we thank you so much for doing that. And we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Thanks, guys.